Hi and welcome to episode 11 of Metastatic Modernity. I'm recovering astrophysicist Tom Murphy. This episode is a brief digression about why renewables and recycling won't solve the predicament of modernity. I hate to interrupt the process of putting modernity into context and perspective, but I think this issue is important to cover. So first, I'm a hands-on kind of guy. I like to build things. I'm always building and learning, and so it was natural that I built my own system of photovoltaics in various stages. So I explored different battery technologies and chemistries, PV technology, uh, charge controllers, inverters, the ins and outs of off-grid living, etc. So I feel that I know the physics, I know the technology, the practicalities, the compromises better than most people would. My default position going into all this was that abundant solar energy would solve our climate change and peak oil concerns. But it turns out that narrow solutions seem to work splendidly if sufficiently narrowing the definition of the problem. And I'm going to attempt to expand the boundaries here. So first off, climate change dominates a lot of our attention when it comes to current problems. Uh, I think step one is to reduce the problem to a simplistic focus on CO2, at which point the solution becomes easy. You know, solar, wind, electric vehicles, and you're done, you know, fantastic. Uh, but that's very little to address the ecological nosedive. I mean, if you look at the list of concerns and causes in episode seven, uh, climate change is on the list, but it's not at the top. I don't want to be misinterpreted here. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a climate change denier, but I think the bigger denial is that climate change is the main problem. So even on technical grounds, renewables as a solution are somewhat dubious. And I'm going to skip over the part where electricity from renewables is not really an adequate substitute for what fossil fuels have provided, because for me, that's beside the main point. Um, replacement is not an appropriate goal to begin with. One important factor is that renewables are very materials hungry. We have here um, a depiction from data uh, that came from the Department of Energy Quadrennial Technology Review, review um, showing the material requirements of different ways to make electricity. Now, in fairness, the plot leaves off the mass of the fossil fuels themselves, just the material requirements to convert to energy. What we see is that renewables just tower over the other forms by an order of magnitude. And the issue is that renewables are diffuse and spread out, so you need a lot of material to collect and convert that energy. Um, you know, the energy itself is renewable, the sunlight, the wind, it restores, uh, it doesn't go away by using it, but our means of getting it are completely dependent on non-renewable materials. So it basically is a non-renewable technology. Um, an analogy is that, you know, fossil fuel combustion requires oxygen, which seems to be in practically unlimited supply. So does that mean fossil fuels are unlimited? Of course not. I mean, that's what a limiting factor means. Um, who cares if one component is effectively unlimited? The limiting factor for so-called renewable energy is the non-renewable materials necessary to produce the energy uh, and convert it. So if you can show me a solar panel made of self-regenerating materials like plant matter, then maybe we could call that renewable, which I think I just described a, a leaf, uh, although a leaf doesn't produce electricity. Let's compare the technological constructs that we make to those of life, which use elements that are in broad circulation all around us. And if we look at the human body, for instance, almost all of it, those first four components at the bottom, are derived from air and water, either directly or through plants. And that's 96% of the total mass. It's an amazing trick. I mean, it's really stunning. Imagine, for instance, a solar panel that you can make out of basically air and water. It's, that's not a thing. So um, other elements are involved, you know, calcium, phosphorus, etc. Um, and it took billions of years to work out a way to bring all these things together and make them work uh, for, for the life that we have now. Um, it's extremely advanced technology. As a result, our hacks are primitive and clunky by comparison. Um, now, moreover, you know, this system of life achieves basically perfect recycling. It sustains itself for billions of years. 
And meanwhile, our technology uses all this weird stuff, you know, copper and aluminum and silicon and gold and on and on rare earth materials. That involves mining and pollution, which isn't really good for life and it doesn't last. It's non-renewable stuff. So, you know, think about it. Where's the genius uh, in this comparison? I think to me it's pretty obvious. Now, can't recycling save this dream of non-renewable dependencies? Um, well, first off, you can't recycle what's not already there. Since we're still 80% dependent on fossil fuels, to convert to a renewable infrastructure would in require this massive build-out um, that's ecologically destructive in its own right. So even if you could achieve this sort of fantasy level of 90% recovery end to end full cycle, which is, you know, like I say, a bit of a fantasy, you'd be down to less than half the resource in just seven cycles or less than 10% in 22 cycles. So it prolongs it, it kicks the can down the road, but not indefinitely. Um, at a few decades per cycle, we're talking about centuries at the most, not millennia. And that's short compared to the 10,000 years since we've been doing agriculture, and this phase would be basically over before we know it. And as a result, the modernity beast basically will starve itself based on its utter dependence on non-renewable materials and its non-ecological foundation, just as importantly. But besides the technological limitations, um, a more fundamental question is, what do we do with the energy? Well, the plants and animals know we use it to dominate the world. We cut down forests, we clear land for agriculture, murder plants and animals with herbicides and pesticides. We build cities, highways, dams, cars, gadgets. We use the energy to mine materials, spew the tailings, manufacture goods, release all manner of chemical contaminations into land, air, and water. Um, that the community of life has no evolutionary preparation to process. Um, so why do we do it? Well, we covered in the last episode a lot of likes that we, we you know, conveniences and comforts. Um, that's what's driving this. Now, the underlying attitude here seems to be that the earth is ours, damn it. You know, we can do whatever we want, get out of our way. And so, you know, think about that. The, the, what matters is not so much the form of the energy, it's the cultural attitude with respect to the community of life. It's our intent of what we do with that energy. So I like this one. Dennis Meadows of Limits to Growth fame suggested that, you know, if a person is coming at you with a hammer, uh, intent to do you harm, you don't really care whether it's a hammer or a mace or a gun, a knife. It could even be a staple gun. Um, you know, the, the problem is in the intent of the attacker. So what is our intent regarding the broader community of life? Um, our action suggests that it's a six mass extinction. That's what we're executing and it's utterly tragic. So I ask you to set aside whatever technological zeal you might have for fusion or whatever it might be and ask, do you really care what the technology is? I mean, we spend all our time squabbling over narrow technology issues without asking the big questions. I love this onion headline that the, the world's largest metaphor hits iceberg. And so, yes, I'm going to use this often used metaphor. The Titanic's main problem wasn't that it had a CO2 belching coal fired engine instead of, say, a sleek bank of lithium batteries powered by solar panels. It was the hubris of owning the ocean. Um, it was the intent, not the technology. Ramming the iceberg wasn't the coal's fault. Renewables are just as capable of executing the same mistake. Um, and it's also true in the parallel case of ecological destruction. Renewables are just as capable of uh, keeping us on that path. My question is, which of our activities do we plan to cease under renewable energy? I haven't seen that memo. I mean, is the plan to stop cutting forests, clearing land, killing plants and animals, building cities, highways, dams, gadgets, mining, manufacturing, generating waste, polluting? Will we stop pursuing the likes that inevitably create this raft of dislikes? So recall that climate change has lots of company on the list of dislikes, and eliminating climate change from the list would be a great outcome, but far from getting us out of trouble. I mean, think about really, isn't the whole point 
of renewables to save modernity by keeping it fully powered? If not, what is the main point? So I think keeping modernity fully powered by any means will basically maintain ecological pressures beyond the breaking point to our own ultimate peril. I um, want you to ask yourself, you know, do the plants and the animals cheer that we might possibly steam along under an entirely new engine? Okay, so that's it for now. Next time I'm going to tackle the thorny subject of human supremacy. Wish me luck in that. Uh, until then, as always, I encourage you to look at the more coherent written companion to this episode that you can find at the Do the Math blog. See you next time.